Okay. I think we're going to get this thing started. I'm still trying to sort out the whole delay thing between Lightstream and, <laughs> and YouTube. So you may have heard some keyboard clicking for a moment. I think when I switch cameras, I should actually just start talking. But, um, you know, it's crazy. I did not see this new light, Tommy, the Chromus 5 by one Well, did I? Is this the huge one that was up on a uh, new shooter? I don't know. I mean, no, on Cinema 5D. I remember seeing one that was like a six-foot one, which I thought was four up. Uh, what's up, Gerald? So, All right, here we go. Let's just do an official start. Hey, everybody, Jem Schofield of the C47, and welcome to episode 52 of Gearbox 2.0. And uh, this is another live stream. I think next week and the week after that will be recorded episodes on product. Uh, lots of stuff going on here. Yesterday I was in the car for, whew, I think I drove 11 plus hours. Uh, we were moving my daughter down to uh, her first year at university. It was a heck of a start at 3.30 in the morning and getting back at around 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. What's up, Film Kit? Lab Rat Productions. Uh, afternoon to you and good morning to me. And wow. Okay, so I'm assuming that you can see me. I'm assuming that you can hear me. Please let me know. And just a thumbs up from one person in the chat would be great. I uh, don't think we're going for a full hour today just because of what this week has in store for me. Um, we'll go half hour, 40 minutes, and then I have to prep for a still shoot for the next two days. I have to get ready for Cameron Flask. Link at the top of the chat. This week's episode, it's a $25,000 camera challenge. Uh, really a camera kit, and there you go. Glad to hear live for a change. Uh, we can hear you fine. Good looks and sounds okay. Hear ya. Boom. Done. Okay. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, I like doing the live streams, quite honestly, because there's interaction. Uh, we've got the chat going. You ask questions. This one in particular, because what I want to do is talk to you about what camera should you use or I use uh, or buy and that really runs the gamut when it comes to everything uh, from a DSLR to a mirrorless camera system. Yes, I know, it's always a camera system to gem. I don't like referring my, to myself in the third person, but there was a funny comment about that. Um, but it is a system because it's never just a camera and you have to talk about the whole package and everything that's there. And then if you want, you can call it a camera kit. Whatever you're into, I'm not judging. Uh, <laughs> there's enough judging going on in the world. That's why I leave politics and religion and those things out of these uh, live streams and the content I do. Man, it's a mess out there, and that's all I've got to say because, again, I'm leaving it out of here. So um, let's talk about cameras a little bit. We are in... Um, arguably, if we want to use the term golden age, uh, we are in very much the golden age of get, <laughs> more coffee, more water, more sleep. We are in the golden age of cameras. Uh, you know, you could argue that there have been moments in time where there have been, been big changes. I would say that 16 millimeter cameras were a big change because they allowed filmmakers while, you know, um, basically, uh, we'll say film size change, we call it sensor size now, um, which of course made the filmmaker change in terms of what types of lenses they were using to get certain fields of view, so on and so forth. Um, the cameras became smaller, and for both documentary and also for narrative work, that was a big shift. They moved away from, you know, not moved away, but added this other form factor. Um, 
And then 35 millimeter camera systems started to shrink. And then we also had a big change when uh, video came to the market, but most notably for most of us when mini DV came into the market, especially after we sort of saw uh, after a couple of generations past the PD-150, we started to see 24P, most notably in the DVX-100 series. And then we started to see the EX series. And these camera systems really started to change um, how we were using things. And then, of course, that was uh, also a switch over to using cards as opposed to tape. Um, sent you an email in the light. Cameras are dope, too. Sigma FP coming soon. I'm excited about that, Tommy. Um, what did I miss? Is this live? Bad karma. It's live. I'm here for you, buddy. We just started a few minutes ago. It's going to be a shorter episode, but we're talking about cameras. I'm going to keep my eye on the chat here. If you have a particular question or a comment for me personally, and you want me to see it, then just use the at the C47, the way Tommy and Shazam, the iPad producer, have done. Crazy how 10-bit has become the standard in such a short time and raw even. Compare that to just a year ago. Film kit, huge changes uh, going on in the industry right now. I would say enormous. And the, the thing that we know solidly now is that this smaller form factor is not going away. Um, we transitioned from DSLRs to mirrorless. We've been using mirrorless cameras forever when it comes to video. That's basically what a digital cinema camera is. It's a mirrorless camera system with all the other GAC and things like that. But, uh, but this shift to what we're seeing now with the S1H, we're seeing with the Blackmagic po Pocket uh, 4K and 6K cameras, and uh, I would even argue to a certain degree what we're seeing from Fujifilm with things like the X-T3. We're really seeing camera systems that are in that smaller form factor that can be extended in terms of their capabilities, which is both a good and a bad thing for that form factor, and that a allow us to capture images now from a quality standpoint that, uh, well, we're lucky, 10-bit, 422, uh, very gradable log, wider color gamuts. It's all good stuff that we win with. And then, of course, we start to see that there has been some big changes in the digital cinema market. We take a look at cameras like the FS5, well under $5,000 US. Um, we'll see if there's going to be an evolution of that camera. I think there's still a space for that for Sony, especially with the way they position the FX9 uh, the FS7 Mark II, and unless they just decide right now, let's just keep dropping the price of the original FS7, then you'll do FS5, FS7, FS7 Mark II, uh, FX9. I think the companies suffer when they have too much product in the market, unless the price point is huge. I mean, you can still get generally a uh, C100 Mark I, which I'd really like the Mark II to kind of drop to this price in sort of the $2,000 to $2,500 US price range. Um, some advantages to the Mark II, one of the big ones, of course, is the screen does actually flip, uh, which makes it better for stuff. What do you think about the cameras on the iPhone 11? Um, Bad Karma 714, I would say that, um, so it took me a long time to upgrade to the uh, to a new iPhone. I upgraded from a 6 Plus to the XS last year, and that was a dramatic improvement in terms of cameras, and we have the two-camera system in there, and I'm quite happy with that. I think the question is more, what do I think about the iPhone 11 Pro's new cameras, where you have the triple, the trifecta of uh, cameras inside of there, or lenses uh, with a single camera. Do I call that a camera system? I don't think so. But um, I would say that uh, I'm impressed, but you know, we see these sort of gimmicky things start to happen. So we're gonna see a lot of wide angle stuff. Um, I think for me, it's the choice of being able to use something that's inside of my pocket like this and to be able to have some choices in post-production, especially if I'm choosing certain apps that allow me to shoot in RAW, then I can harness the kind of power of having those 
uh, three lenses so that I can make some changes without degrading, in theory, the image quality, though each one of those lenses and how they work is slightly different. In fact, I kind of do think that they're all separate cameras because it's not just three lenses hitting one sensor. So it's kind of crazy stuff. Um, we are seeing a lot of movement on full frame and APS, uh, APS-C. What do you think it's going to happen to M43, which is micro four thirds, and what path do you think it will take? What's up, Zlatko? Nice to see you. We are cinema. So um, <clears throat> micro four thirds is a funny one because it's never for me personally been a favorite. I've been a fan of the GH4 and the GH5 series for a long time. Um, but I think to get the most out of, out of those camera systems, it does make sense for a lot of people to use speed boosters so that they can increase that field of view when they're using other lenses, uh, most notably either APS-C based or more commonly full frame lenses. Um, Micro Four Thirds is not going to disappear. And remember that the 4K Blackmagic Pocket Camera does use Micro Four Thirds as its sensor size. And we are still seeing that sensor size in the GH5 and GH5S. Uh, so from that standpoint, I would say um, it's not going away. And then we also have Zcam. And you, you know, market penetration may not be huge, but they want to make sure that they are supporting their previous users and micro four thirds is definitely a mount that they're using. There's the funky JVC camera that uses a micro four thirds mount, but has a larger sensor. Um, let's be honest, there's a lot of glass out there that's micro four thirds and some of it's really good from companies like Panasonic and Olympus and things like that. So uh, again, not really the, the sensor size that I, and you sometimes have to differentiate the lens mount from the sensor size in certain cases, but it's not really the sensor size that I'm drawn to. I like Super 35 APS-C or full frame. Um, and I'm also really interested in sort of this whole pocket IMAX thing with Fujifilm with their uh, new medium format cameras. And let's see how that evolves with um, with those really large sensors. I'm still invested in Canon DSLR, not too interested in mirrorless system because of the cost to make the change, instead interested in the C200 as a potential upgrade. Okay, Richard, now we're getting into it. Time to chat a little bit. So. I get a lot of questions, uh, both from the channel and also when I am dealing with clients, because part of my other life is actually going on site and doing education for companies and organizations. And part of that uh, usually involves a conversation about the equipment that they are using. In fact, that reminds me, I have to set an alarm to uh, <laughs> contact one of my clients about a question they have because some equipment that they had on their buy list has either been discontinued or changed. So, um, so cameras, of course, come up a lot in that conversation. And, and one of the first things that I want to help people do is determine what it is that they think they're going to be using this camera system for. Now, it's a lot easier to recommend a camera for a single project than it is for a purchase. If you're gonna look at something as an owner operator, I think it requires a lot more research and a lot more thought than saying, okay, I'm going out next week. Um, we're gonna be going and shooting sit down interviews with people uh, for a corporate project or a documentary or whatever it's gonna be. Um, we need a small light kit, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, and I don't say that lightly. I think what lighting you're using and lighting control is of the utmost importance. And so is the audio equipment you're using, especially in small to no crew when you don't hire a sound recorders, but you're saying, okay, so now we have to go shoot this stuff. Well, what you want is a camera system that you don't have to think about a lot. And generally that you don't have to spend a lot of time in post-production in terms of finessing that image. So you want a camera system that generally has built-in audio, built-in neutral density. If you're inside or outside, you don't know. Uh, you want that camera system to 
basically uh, hopefully have a large sensor so that if you're in small spaces, you can still get a relatively shallow depth of field. An AF system would help. And, uh, you know, in that type of situation, I would probably say, look, you want something that just works and also that you're not going to have to work really hard in terms of nice skin tones and things like that. Where does that put us? Well, there's a number of cameras you could use, but if you just wanted to take a camera out of a, uh, a case and you wanted to set it up, or a couple of cameras for an AB camera situation, then you might want to consider things like a C300 Mark II because it has all of those ingredients. You might want to consider if you don't need the AF features, something like an FS7 or an FS7 Mark II. Those would be good choices. Now that doesn't mean that a Blackmagic Ursa G2 camera, Ursa Mini Pro, wouldn't be a good choice. Uh, huge improvements in terms of their color science and what I'm seeing with those camera systems. An EVA 1 would work well too, again, if uh, AF is not the main consideration. And eventually, especially if you're looking for full frame, then I would say a camera like the FX9 from Sony. I recommend the FS7 series to people all of the time as an all-arounder camera system when they want to start to think about buying something. Now, C200 would work well as well. Um, why wouldn't I use that camera, the C200, as opposed to a C300 Mark II? Uh, a couple of reasons. Number one, I think that the image that you can mold in the C300 Mark II is a better image unless you're going to cinema raw light, and I don't want to deal with that workflow in a corporate <clears throat> documentary type of situation. Um, and two, I think that the choices that you have in terms of setting up the camera system are a little bit better in terms of LUTs, LUT workflow. Um, and again, it really goes back to what is that captured image. And if you're going to the SD cards and you're exposing your images properly, C200 is a fantastic camera, but not for a lot more money in the long term if you're thinking about owning. If you got <clears throat> the C300 Mark II uh, touch kit, um, you would have a camera system that, aside from off-speed recording, is still a beast of a camera. Okay, now there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, <clears throat> Tommy says cameras don't matter uh, as much anymore by lights. Look, they're all great. Um, have you heard about the Fuji GFX100? They say it has 100 megapixels. Yes, I have. Um, <clears throat> and they also have the 50. I am, hold on. Give me a second. <clears throat> mm. I think I messed up there. <laughs> I I tried to mute. <laughs> I cleared my throat. Uh, and then I think in light stream, I was supposed to say send to live. I don't know why, but there you go. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so the GFX series is really interesting. That's kind of like the whole idea of having a an IMAX in your pocket. I think that we need to see some more evolution there in terms of how you capture that image, log, data rate, all of that stuff. But I am excited about that. Using Canon uh, M50 with Speed Booster, starting a small collection of EF lenses because I think my upgrade path is to the BMPCC. Uh, 6K, does that make sense, uh, or does this make sense? I think it does. I mean, the M50 is a nice little camera. Um, I definitely wouldn't invest much into those lenses because they are very proprietary, very hard, those M uh, EOS M lenses. I have a couple, you know, I think that they're okay. I've used them on my M3 and some other M series cameras, and that really had a lot of promise in terms of a vlogging camera in the past. Um, but I think that upgrade path makes sense. Investing in EF lenses is not a bad path to go. Um, years ago, I would have said don't invest in E-mount lenses, but there's so many E-mount lenses now. And what's nice about them is, um, you know, obviously they are well suited to that lens mount without adding extra stuff to your camera system. The thing that's not great about E-mount is that it is, as a mount, very adaptable to pretty much any lens system. But if you're investing in the lenses themselves, you're kind of stuck. 
unless you have a camera system that has uh, a flange depth that will allow you to adapt E-mount to that camera, which is not many, if any, that I know of. Um, what's up, David? Okay, so while on the subject of Canon, thoughts on eye-controlled autofocus historically didn't work great, but with today's tech, it seems like an interesting feature. Justin, I'd say... Um, this is a huge advancement in terms of what we're seeing when it comes to camera technology. And the AF system, whether a traditional um, narrative kind of you know, workflow would not, well, here's the deal. There's a lot of people years ago who said, oh, we're getting autofocus. And when I say years, I mean years. I mean, the C300 Mark II has been out for four plus years. Uh, I'll never, I'll never rely upon that. Well, in certain situations you can, and I think it has its, uh, its place, especially in corporate production, especially in situations like this, where I'm standing here doing a, uh, a live stream. And I think that, um, AF technology is getting really smart. Um, we have, uh, AI, you know, there's databases of uh, stuff that's being stored in the camera systems that says, okay, so this is like this type of situation. I know that's a little bit of an aside, but really Nikon, Nikon, I think was really at the forefront of all of this because what they used to do when they started to go digital is they would have a database of different stored on the camera of different shooting scenarios. And when you're using the camera system, not in a manual way, um, it basically refer to this database and say, okay, these are the lighting conditions. This is the scenario. Let me go ahead and make changes to give you the best possible picture. Now, is that gonna work 100% of the time? No, uh, but if you're shooting in raw, maybe it's not that big of a deal. And I'm talking about stills here, but in terms of video, we have to, I think in the correct places embrace the fact that there is an evolution of technology. I am super excited that the FX9 now has and has taken the AF system that Sony has been putting into uh, essentially, you know, their mirrorless camera systems, the A7 series, uh, A9 series, A7 III kind of being the pinnacle right now, and then I'm sure we'll see even more advancements. And all of these things are good for us as users. So the beautiful thing about AF technology, including eye control or eye uh, controlled autofocus, um, and I think you, do you mean when you are getting AF on the eye and it's basically triggering the AF system and tracking with it. Um, obviously, there's a lot of camera systems using that and not just detecting humans, but uh, also animals. Those are all good things. I mean, I'm sure that will evolve to object-based AF as well. It's not hard to build a database that recognizes something that looks like the shape of a cup or a flask a flask, uh, or other common objects where you can basically say, okay, I'm going to track this object. It recognizes that it's a chair or it's, uh, again, a glass or a plate of food or whatever it's going to be so that sometimes you're, you're not sitting in situations where um, the camera system is conflicted, right? Because what we normally want to do is this is the magic right here. We want to focus on the eyes and we want that to be tack sharp. But what if you wanted to focus on a different part of the human body, um, you know, and it wasn't the eyes. Uh, for some reason, you're shooting a video and or you're shooting a scene or something like that. And you want to make sure that you're tack sharp here on the mouth and then you focus on that or on the glass that they're holding and you don't want it to keep hunting for the person's face and so you want it to be on a particular object that could have some advantages in uh, commercial applications and i don't mean commercial as in the commercial i mean commercials and things like that music videos where the object is more important than the person's face or eyes um, so there's different things you can start to think about when it comes to those features. And I'm sure we'll see an evolution of that as time goes by. And then you also have um, whatever you want to call it with Elytro and these multiple lens camera systems where there's a database which it's got depth information in there. And what you might be able to do is shoot a scene. You will be able to shoot a scene and say, 
you know, um, it was using AF and it was on the eyes, but what I want to do now is I actually want to track this object. There's enough depth data in there that even though you want that scene to feel like it was shot at a 2 or a 2.8, that within that area, you can basically focus on something else and then everything else falls soft. Um, it, we're not far, I don't think, maybe a year, three years tops from having motion-based depth control in smartphones where we can shoot not just stills, but also video. And um, that'll be a big advancement as well. And I think we'll start to see that technology making its way into our mirrorless and our digital cinema cameras as well. Um, okay, so let's backtrack here and go back to the whole concept, keep posting stuff of how do you choose your camera system? Well, application is important. You're getting on an airplane and you need to have two camera systems and you're going to a foreign country and you're shooting something that's dock-based or maybe not even dock-based, but um, is corporate-based. It's so much easier in that situation to say, let's get a couple of mirrorless uh, camera systems uh, they could be S1Hs, they could be GH5 or GH5Ss, they could be pocket cameras, though they look a little more video-ish than a standard mirrorless, they could be X-T3s uh, from, from Fujifilm, they could be an A7 III from Sony, they could be any of those things. They could be an EOS R, a lot of people are shooting a lot of stuff with EOS R, they love the fact that if they don't use RF mount lenses, they can get that adapter and they can actually have a variable and D between the camera body and their EF lenses. So in those situations, especially when cameras uh, from companies like Sony and Panasonic have attachments where you can put a very, very small XLR adapter onto the camera uh, to get XLR inputs in there, I think that those are great solutions for those types of situations. You don't want to have a lot of equipment. You can travel with smaller tripod systems. You can, and we call it a tripod system because it's the tripod and it's the head itself. You can also, um, in those situations, you know, travel with a, a dual channel receiver uh, wireless system, which we're seeing more and more of in both the 2.4 gigahertz and uh, traditional frequency ranges. And from a lighting standpoint, this is where things like Westcott's flex lights come in in a huge way. The ability to be able to pack flat and to have you know rollable or uh, stacked on top of LEDs that have low power draw, high output, and they're adaptable for worldwide use. I think that those are huge things. So that's where, for me, the mirrorless thing comes in. I think mirrorless is also fantastic um, when you're talking about situations where you're creating content for online. In a lot of those situations, you want a camera system that has a great AF system because it's one or two people who are talking to camera. Um, we're also seeing some interesting motion control options now. There's one that was just posted on New Shooter, which has uh, AI for tracking people. It's not a new thing, but we're seeing that evolve. So the combination of being able to set up a small camera system and then have the cameras AF working and also the actual motion control system following you gives you a lot more potential for creating more interesting content. For me personally, that's one of the things that I'm looking at is I'm looking at what if I have my A camera on a um, some sort of remote head that has some tracking capabilities in terms of me so I can move around and then I also have a good AF system on the camera with IAF well that means that when I'm talking to camera and that's feeding to let's say an A10 mini for a live stream that's my main A camera and then what I can do is cut to additional cameras to show different viewpoints for educational content um, so I think that we have a lot of things to think about here I have my own particular needs and applications, and one of the things that I can say, again, having to do with autofocus, is you really have to determine um, what kinds of content you're creating. A lot of the content that I create, not really for this channel, but for clients, is educational-based content. So when we're cranking that stuff out with two or three cameras, AF is huge for us. We wanna shoot, um, shallow depth of field, so we want to shoot generally, maybe not at a 1.4, but we want to shoot at a 2.8 or a 2. We want stuff to look nice. 
So we want to use longer lenses, shoot more wide open. And the AF system, when we are tracking, especially with touch AF, can be a huge advantage. Um, what are my thoughts on the red compressed raw patent and if how it affects development of ProRes raw and uh, Blackmagic raw? Well, I don't know if it affects Blackmagic raw because I think that they have implemented a, um, a different way of handling that, which um, doesn't use the same debayering process that is being used by RET. I think that the reason that Apple is going through with this from a legal standpoint is there are probably issues related to ProRes RAW, which unless they sort out the patent will prevent that from being used on the camera side. I don't think it's necessarily an issue, it doesn't seem to be, from an external recorder or a post-production standpoint, but Obviously, it will be a lot better if, um, for instance, we know that Arri cameras will shoot and record to ProRes. If they can now shoot and record to ProRes RAW with a future upgrade, if Apple works this out, then I think that will be an advantage for certain shooters and could also open up ProRes RAW to be used internally with other cameras. A lot of chatter about that because, of course, um, Atomos is well on board when it comes to ProRes RAW in a big way. And if Apple is able to put that internally into camera systems, that will also open up things. But remember, there's a lot of cameras that will not have that option and probably can't upgrade to it. So I think there's still a valid place for those external um, recorders. What I'd really like to see from Atomos, to be honest with you, is I'd really like to see that Ninja Star upgraded. I've been talking about it for years. It is a very small um, just recorder. It used CFast cards, um, but it was only HD. And I think we need to see an evolution of that. Not everybody now at this point needs a monitor recorder. We just need a small, very compact, maybe with, um, hold on, <clears throat> maybe with a small screen uh recorder so we can just see status and have confidence i don't think that colored lights always help in every situation i think it's nice to see a record icon a stop uh icon a play icon whatever you know what i'm saying a pause play and that's uh record so i i think we'll have to see how this all evolves it was exciting at ibc to see some movement when it comes to Blackmagic RAW and ProRes RAW and the adoption. Um, I think it's going to be important uh, long term for some users to have Blackmagic RAW support in Final Cut Pro 10. And I don't know how that all works when it comes to um, Blackmagic RAW, ProRes RAW as competing essentially formats and if that can happen, but I would really hope that it happens uh, partially, selfishly, because I use Final Cut Pro 10, but also I think for the community, um, there's so many people out there and we're sort of between Premiere Pro and Final Cut Pro 10, and I'd really like to see support in both of those NLEs for both of those versions of RAW. Uh, so the red patent only applies to in-camera compressed RAW. I agree with the Ninja Star upgrade. Yeah, that's my understanding, FilmKit. Uh, I don't know 100% if that's the case. Okay, so let's get back to cameras. More questions. I want to help you sort out if you are thinking about buying a camera system or using one for a particular project. Do you have a question about that? Um, we kind of step up from the mirrorless camera systems when we start to think about um, a workhorse camera. Now, I'm not saying that a mirrorless camera can't be a workhorse camera. And if you leave that sucker built up with your very ND and you leave it with your audio kit attached and you have your monitoring solution and all of that stuff, then I think that makes a lot of sense. I also think that mirrorless cameras are fantastic for things like gimbals. So you've got a Ronin SC or uh, you know, um, you know, a, another gimbal system and you want to use it for that. Um, the biggest challenge we have when it comes to mixing and matching uh, cameras is sensors because we, save for Aerie, 
know that the vast majority of the cameras out there use different sensors and even different sensors from camera to camera from the same manufacturer. Now, C500 Mark II has the same sensor as a C700. Is it going to be tuned exactly the same way in terms of color science? I would ho hope so, but that's not always the case. So upgrading from C100 to what if you are a corporate shooter and have some nice Canon lenses already? So Alex, that's a great question. It's a tough one because the first thing I think you have to ask yourself is, do I need off-speed recording options? And is that really important to me? Because I would say, and I would argue, uh, argue is the wrong word. I would say that at this point, even four plus years down the road, if you got the C300 Mark II touch focus kit, that that is the beast of cameras from uh, from a day in day out standpoint, it has all the ingredients except for one major thing, which is off speed recording. You are um, limited to 4K 30, and so from that standpoint, that could be the deal breaker. It also has to do with, and this is important to acknowledge: what is your price point? Where do you want to be in terms of investing in there? If you've got the rest of the ecosystem. Do you want to um, buy a camera that's under $10,000? Of course, we always want to. But uh, are you willing to spend closer to the fifteen dollars to $20,000 camera uh, in that price range? Are you looking for one or two bodies in terms of what you're doing? Um, you know, uh, the Hitman says, any thoughts on going from the C200 to the 500 Mark II? Um, you're welcome for the content and the show. I appreciate that. Um, so if you are in an EF lens workflow, you kind of have two choices. Well, you have a few choices. C200 is kind of the obvious one. That camera system is cost effective. It has touch focus. You have to understand that when you're recording to SD cards internally on that camera, you are recording at 150 megabits per second. You are getting Canon log, uh, and so you shoot generally Canon log three, about 13 stops of dynamic range, really usable 13 stops, and uh, and you'd be recording in Rec. 709. So you don't get these P3, Rec. 2020, these other bigger gamut options that you would get on the C300 Mark II. Um, that said, you have Cinema Raw Light, so you can record to CFast uh, 2.0 cards in camera, and then you open up all kinds of options. And data rate is definitely higher, but gives you a lot of capabilities. Now, you have a couple other choices. C500 Mark II is one of them, obviously at a different price point. That is a ridiculous camera system, and you're also upgrading to full frame in that situation with all of the other bells and whistles, and kind of a C200... C300 uh, Mark II, C700, Frank, not a Frankenstein actually, uh, a really well thought out camera system. But I would say that the other thing that's interesting is that there are a lot of adapters for EF to E mount. And the uh, FX9 with the new AF system is going to be really interesting for people to look at. And I think we need to wait to see how well EF lenses work on that camera system. But there are a ton of people using EF lenses on FS7s and FS7 Mark IIs and FS5s. Um, the thing that those cameras are missing for some people is the autofocus capabilities. So I would think that, who's this gem GEM guy? What's going on here, Alex? I'm just messing with you. Um, Rumor has it there's uh, there's going to be an XC style camera with RF mount. Yeah, Gregory, I don't know what the deal is with that. I saw the patent and what's being shown there. It'll be interesting. I'm a huge fan of the form factor of the XC10 and XC15. I had a couple of gripes with that. Um, loved the you know CFast. I love the data rate. Um, I thought that you were getting a nice image out of the camera. I don't want fixed lens. I love that form factor. If I could get that form factor, even an EF mount, I would be thrilled to bits. Put a uh, you know super 35 millimeter sensor on there and make that your replacement for the C100, C100 Mark II. They kind of need to figure this out right now. They have the option Canon does to drop the C300 Mark II down a little bit more. And if they drop that to maybe the, 
7500 uh, price range. They need sort of have these two cameras that were distinctly different in terms of price point, but then they still need to, in theory, compete in that four to $5,500 price range. And they can't do it with an HD camera at this point in time. So my feeling is you either drop the price of the C200 into that price point, which you kind of have to do, um, or you come out with another camera. I don't know if we're going to see another camera. So we'll see what happens. Uh, video. What's that? Alex Smith. What are you saying, video? I don't get that. Does the C200 Mark II give me a huge image quality upgrade in terms of for the web quality? Alex, that's a great question. Um, I think that the C300 Mark II is a great upgrade overall. Um, it's de definitely a bigger quality upgrade in terms of jump from the C100 or C100 Mark II to the C300 Mark II than this to the C200 unless you are recording in cinema raw light. Um, I would say that it is definitely an upgrade. You're going to um, essentially, you know, 4K. You are uh, increasing, you know, image quality overall. But for the web, if that's really your delivery, C200 is a fantastic camera system. It just doesn't give you all of those other options. There is some off-speed recording options too, but it is limited in terms of how much you can tune that. We talked a couple of weeks ago about finding a camera for around $2,000 that can be used for narrative doc and possibly corporate work. I'm thinking I may need to buy used or wait for six months, David. Uh, yeah, so I have my own feelings on this. I'm a huge fan of the X-T3. I think that 10-bit 422 um, capabilities, the fact that I can do 10-bit 420 internally, uh, high data rate up to 400 megabits per second. And what I like about it is not only are the lenses affordable, um, but they are natively APS-C. Um, <clears throat> so you're getting essentially super 35 millimeter camera system without having to futz with um, uh, <clears throat> speed boosters and adapters and all that kind of stuff. Now, you have to decide how your audio is going to be handled. Fujifilm has not come out with a little audio XLR adapter like Sony and Panasonic has. So you have to think about those components when you're talking about getting that camera. But I'm very, very happy with the X-T3. But if you're not in a rush, wait another six months or another three months. Let's see how the whole camera season shakes out over the next uh, really six to eight weeks especially with Photo Plus and stuff, and see if there's some new cameras that are available. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think the solution is to marry the XC and C100 into one body. Yeah, it would be great. Um, okay, good. If you're not, are you saying, David, you're not concerned about 4 or 6K? If you're not really concerned about 4 or 6K, and the advantage, of course, in post is more flexibility in terms of what you can do with the image, then you have a lot of options. I mean, I still think that the C100 Mark II is one of the best values in a camera system. I think it would make a lot of sense, though, if you're going to invest even a couple of thousand dollars to make sure that your camera system is not natively um, limited to recording HD only. Uh, in terms of lenses, Antosh asks, uh, what mount would you want to buy into now if starting from scratch? Thanks. Well, I think that has to do with what type of work you are doing. Um, it's really a tough one because in terms of the most flexibility, it could be argued that E-mount is one of the most flexible mounts out there. If you want to adapt different lenses to it. And I mean in terms of what's out there broadly. There are other mirrorless lens mounts, X mount from Fujifilm, um, the, uh, you know, the L mount is a good example, but they are not as broadly adopted. So I would say that if you're looking for a camera system where you want to adapt lots and lots of different lenses from lots of different places, E-mount makes a lot of sense. What I like about the FS7 Mark II and now the FX9 is they have a locking E-mount. Um, there is 
data that can be passed through electronically to there. And there's a lot of manufacturers making adapters and speed boosters that will allow you to pass that through so you can take advantage of controlling the lens from the camera body and also, in many cases, the AF features. Um, did you change your mind on Cinegear Atlanta Gem? I'm going, would love to meet if you were. I don't know if I changed my mind. Uh, I'd love to go. I'd love to go to every show and hang out and talk gear and all of that stuff. It's just not in the cards for me. I have uh, essentially an early October, shush. I have an early October, which is going into uh, a lot of travel. So I'm gonna be uh, here prepping for some production. I'm then going down to California. And then as soon as I get back, I'm repacking and going to New York for um, NAB New York, I'm really teaching workshops that are in and around that show. And then I'm back and then it looks like I'm going right back into production and then possibly some other travel. So I want to go. Um, I'm down for it. I'm bummed that I didn't get to actually go to Cine Gear this year, but I wasn't bummed that I got to see my oldest uh, graduate from high school. So that was far more important and was much better for me. So look, I kind of lied a little bit. I can't go a full hour because I have a call coming up and my schedule yesterday and all that fun stuff. It's 9.45 here, so I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, hopefully we made some progress. I'm not sure we have uh, even scratched the surface of this conversation. So maybe we'll do a part two at some point. Don't forget that today at 6 p.m. Eastern, we are doing another episode. This is episode, in my mind, 43, and that's what we put down on there. Uh, ben is back from Safari, which is crazy. And um, we're gonna be having a $25,000 camera kit challenge so uh link is at the top of the chat right at the top of the chat you can scroll up and i hope to see some of you there i appreciate you all coming to the live streams it makes it a lot more interactive again next week and possibly the week after if i can work it into my schedule i will do some recorded episodes maybe i can uh crank one out from the road and i've got to figure a bunch of stuff out in terms of my schedule um, Alex would vote for a part two. Yeah, it might be part three, part four. This is a never ending conversation and one that I'm happy to help you hopefully figure out. Um, Antosh, thanks for finally posting. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm laughing at the lurker comment there and, uh, that's what it's all about. And you would, vote to make gem equal gem. Alex, that is a conversation that is, uh, it's like a black hole. There's no way that's happening. I've been living with this name for a long time and uh, I appreciate everybody being here. Come to the live chat, Cameron Flask, later on today. If you have the time, make sure you have a drink on hand. Uh, I think I'm gonna crack open a new bottle of scotch today, depending uh, we'll see how that all goes and I'll see you guys next time on Gearbox. I'm going to switch over now to basically a title card, which will let us, uh, end off the show. And that way I won't cut everybody off. Still figuring this whole light stream thing out. I think at the beginning, you probably just see me staring at my screen for about 30 seconds, wondering when that feed's going to show up because there's a delay, but that's the way it works. That's the way they say the cookie crumbles. And I appreciate again, everybody for coming and I'll see you guys next time.